You made it across the second and the third field. When you passed the row house, the large brick house, where the lady greeted you from the top, you went from the second field to the third. Now, you got up to the last buildings between you and the stone wall in Marie's Heights at the end of this street. This brick building is Alan Stratton's home. Stratton was a wheelwright. He was a fellow who dealt in livestock, and his house was perfectly situated before the battle. Because right behind you was Fredericksburg's agricultural fairgrounds, Mercer Square, a 10-acre lot with right up or upright board fences on it. The north wall would have been right here where the sidewalk is today. So a fellow who works in livestock is right next to where they deal in livestock. This place had known slaughter long before the war, just didn't know it in a human version. Not until December 13th, 1862, 157 years ago this week, thousands of Union soldiers charged up out of those bottoms, came up against this bare ground, tried to get around Alan Stratton's house. Now, if you have a board fence where the sidewalk is, and you have a big house in the middle of your battle line, soldiers can't go through the house. They're going to have to go around the house. That's going to channel them into a tiny little conduit between the edge of that house and the edge of this street. As they bunch up, they're going to make a perfect target for the Confederates above us. We're 280 yards from them. The effective rifle range exceeds 300 yards. Cannon has been bedeviling you across the second and the third field. But as we got to just about where those houses are at the end of the block, Confederate cannon found it very difficult from high ground to depress their tubes and fire down. There was a blind spot. But that's exactly where we walk into the fire of infantrymen carrying rifles, like the Irish Brigade. The Confederates have overlapping fire. And Union soldiers tell us that when they endure the shell fire of the cannons, they instinctively hike their collar and drop their heads as if they're trying to brace themselves against this rainstorm. But as they get to where we are, they walk out of one storm and into a deadlier storm. Not big shells, but tiny little missiles aimed at death. Let's make it work. All the attackers that have preceded us, their attacks have come here. They've been destroyed here. They are already dead and wounded here. And the survivors took cover behind the house. They literally crawl up each other's back like bees in a beehive. They also seek shelter in a tiny little ripple in the ground, just the other side of Little Page Street. The ground depresses slightly. And if men lay down, they will have cover and it will be trapped there. The Irish Brigade has to attack through their prone ranks. They don't get out of the way. You have to walk over them. You have to tiptoe your way through them. You have to slow down. And you have to expose yourself to fire longer and perhaps necessary. <laughs> So there's a lot of things about this spot that conspire against Union soldiers. But there is one thing that affects Union soldiers. Alan Stratton has an orchard behind his house and it has a board fence. Union soldiers going around the other side of the house will get closer to the Confederates because they have one board fence to protect them. 
unit attacks the right hand part of the line. 69th New York will get closer to the heights than anybody else. The 88th New York is going to come through where we're standing. 28th Massachusetts just behind you. Then the 63rd New York and the 116th Pennsylvania. As they come up against the fences of the fairground, it splits the attack into three segments. Those on the outside of the fence, like us, those on the inside of the fence, and those on the other side of the fairground. It has yet another fence. It compartmentalizes us and allows the Confederates to systematically fire at three different sections at three different times. They can focus a lot of fire on a little bit of attack. And it's devastating. Peter Walsh, 28th Massachusetts. There were shells blowing whole gaps out of our ranks. And we had to march over their dead and wounded bodies as they tried to pick their way forward. St. Clair Mulholland. We soon forgot the presence of shells in the shower of smaller missiles that assaulted us. <clears throat> Colonel Robert Nugent, 69th New York. The men were passing over the dead and dying of the brave fellows of French and Zook. The brigade charged and it kept its line of battle as perfect as possible under such a galling fire. As the men dropped or fell when shot, the line kept closing in and not a man faltered. It's quite a tribute. So what does it do? Nothing. These men were slaughtered here. Commander of the 69th New York, Robert Dugan, you said that not a man faltered. He fell almost wound, wounded almost immediately beside this house. His replacement was a major named James Cavanaugh, a very diminutive fella, nicknamed the Tiny Major. He wasn't tiny enough. He was shot through the thigh. As they picked him up to carry him off the field, he told the men, blaze away and stand to it, boys. His replacement, Captain Thomas Letty, was shot through the arm. And one-eyed Captain John Donovan, who just came back to duty today, is now in command of the entire regiment. He was shot in the chest and in the shoulder. And he flopped down and passed out in the mud. When he woke up a couple minutes later, he was the only surviving officer in the entire 69th New York. And despite his wounds, he's the man who's going to take them off this field. John Donovan wrote, Oh God, this is truly awful. Our gallant and brave colonel, acting lieutenant colonel, and acting major are all cut down. Nugent, Kavanaugh, Lenny, the heads of the family are gone. And I now involuntarily did what before at any other time I never could do. I shed tears. Tears of gratitude for my own deliverance and tears of sorrow for the many thousands of brave young fellows and comrades who fell that day, not martyrs to a cause, but victim to a grand blunder and of whom I shall never see again. The other regiments were sliced up just as badly. 63rd New York, Major Joseph O'Neill in command, was shot through the arm. His replacement, Captain Patrick Condon, he lost his second man shot through the head. Colonel Dennis Heaton, already wounded in the arm with his Pennsylvania, is wounded again 
This time, shot through the hip. His replacement is his son-in-law, Lieutenant Colonel St. Clair McGustin the Hull. He is also shot through the leg. It has to be carted off this field. Major George Bardwell is their third commander, killed. Captain John T is now in charge. You're on your fourth commander. Only the 88th New York and the 28th Massachusetts keep their commanding officers from beginning to end. But they lost a lot of their officers and men underneath them. Captain John Donovan obviously was angry, and he spoke for the entire brigade. The Battle of Fredericksburg was the bloodiest and the most severe I have yet to experience. While in the meantime, it is the most void of good results. I was not aware that hell personified was so close at hand and ready for our destruction. The Irish Brigade's attack collapsed in less than 30 minutes. 1,250 men came past this point. In 30 minutes, only 250 of them are still with the colors. Doesn't mean that all 1,000 have been killed or wounded, so many of them have been. Many of them are trapped in no man's land between the lines. Many of them are trapped in this little swale. Many of them are stuck in the beehive behind this brick house. In the end, they will count 548 that they lost out of 1,250. 48% casualties. 48%. So when I told you when we started, look at the person to your left, look at the person to your right. One of you did not leave this spot. That's devastating. When we talk about units in battle being decimated by fighting, guessy means 10. Decimated are 10% casualties. 48% casualties are not decimated. They are annihilated. They are obliterated. They are destroyed. Now the Irish Brigade had a mission that exceeded the mission of the other soldiers. They were here to fight for a union, but they were also here to make an impact to fight for a place in that union. Today, the Irish Brigade was destroyed. They will never have the numbers to make a serious impact on another battlefield. They will fight and they will fight on, but they will never have the strength that they once had. It's been taken away from them at places like Antietam and finished at Fredericksburg. How are they going to fulfill their mission of finding a place for the Irish in that new union? To outfight the Americans is a thing of the past now. So at this point, Thomas Francis Maher is going to do something big. He's going to go back to New York. And in January, in New York City, at St. Patrick's Church, they are going to have a funeral for the Irish Brigade. They'll have a large catafalque with a coffin in the middle of the church, and it will give it the last rites, and it will mourn the brigade collectively, reminding the people of the North, reminding the people around the world what the Irish did at Fredericksburg, and that this was their swan song. They died trying to find a place in this America. They died trying to make a better America 
so that we can all find a place in it. An inert zeal to become American. In the end, turns out, all the Americans became just a little bit Irish. Because the Irish Brigade changed our perspective of the Battle of Fredericksburg. Union soldiers hated this spot. They loathed it. Clearly, the Irish were unhappy, too. And Union soldiers used a word they rarely use. This was murder. But the Irish Brigade refused to use that word. They didn't call it murder. They changed our perspective. They said it was never about winning or losing. Nobody could ever win here. They started talking about our attack. We're about duty. Our attack preceded the Irish Brigade. Our attack followed the Irish Brigade. Our attack supported the Irish Brigade. Every Union soldier starts writing about Fredericksburg as one experience related to the Irish Brigade. You weren't in this battle unless you were somehow associated with the Irish Brigade. Union soldiers write about watching their green flags going across the field. And some of those chroniclers aren't within five miles of us. They never saw green flag, much less green flags. But if they were going to convince somebody they were here, then they had to be with these guys. So the Irish Brigade fought for the Union Army, just like every other Union soldier. They fought for a different reason as well, to find a place in that America. They overcame prejudice. They broke down barriers. And the Americans embraced them. They found their place in America. And they opened the door for others to find their place here too. The Republic of Ireland still keeps December 13th on their state calendar as one of the most significant dates in all of Irish history. Because this was the day when the Irish diaspora found legitimacy in another home. It was a terrible cost, but it was a wonderful legacy. Was it worth it? Yes. Absolutely.